everybody and welcome back. So what we're going to talk about now is uh, the materials that you might want to use when you build a radio control aircraft, okay? And I just kind of want to lay this, um, you, you know, the backstory of my life is I try to share with you everything I've done. This isn't speculation. This isn't something I heard or I saw. These are things, these are the actual, actual practices that I use in making my awesome airplanes. So what I want to jump into here is I'm going to use this, um, start with this mosquito as an example of things to think about when you're at the beginning of a design. Now I designed this airplane a while back, but I haven't even touched making it yet because this one is really important to me. And once I start it, I want to go all the way through to it being 100% done. If you've followed me for the last 10 or 15 years, you know that sometimes I'll get a project 70% done and then I'll just shelf it for a year because I get bored or frustrated with it, uh, work on another project and then go back to it and get it flying. There's only two airplanes I've ever made that didn't fly and because I sold them. I was offered a lot of money for them and uh, it's not that they just never got finished and they're sitting in a barn somewhere. Um, I don't do that. I don't have any hanger queens. So what we're going to talk about here at this Mosquito is when before I even went into CAD with it, I had figured out how big I wanted the wings. I had figured out pretty much physically how big I knew the airplane. And then I take my past experiences with my testing and my designing and and building and figure out, okay, how can I make this absolutely light? Because you know everything I build is going to be electric anyway. And I love light electric airplanes. I love really low low cube loading. So um, I knew that I wanted to do a balsa wood built up structure and um, essentially and I, I, know, I knew that the center section of the wing would be part of the fuselage because I love that about my airplanes so that when I'm assembling them, I don't have to set them on a stand or anything. So basically the airframe as a single unit would look like this. Okay, this is a 150 inch wing airplane. So when I get into CAD and I start drawing it, I know my bulkheads are going to be plywood and it's usually going to be eighth inch light plywood from Aircraft Spruce because that's my favorite light ply. And I know everything else I can physically put in there will be balsa wood. And it if it needs to be a little bit stronger, I'll put a little bit of carbon fiber toe on there. I'll laminate it with epoxy. And it's worked really good for me in the past. If you watched any of my past testing or anything, and I'm probably gonna get into doing more of the test videos since I'm getting such a big following on YouTube now, um, just to get updated on what I've learned. But when I, when I look at the Mosquito and I just look at the systems, I know there's gonna be some hardwood in there, like the landing gear blocks. Um, you know, I'm gonna have a flap system that's gonna have to have some hard points. Um, the wing is basically gonna be all balsa wood. Um, with some carbon fiber toe. One thing I love to do to keep airplanes light is I love to put stringers. Instead of big spars, I put stringers. Well, I still have a spar in there, but I like to use the stringers to hold a very thin skin up. And I know it's controversial, but I run my wood grain from the front of the airfoil to the trailing edge of the airfoil. And the reason I do that, if you've got the stringers in there, when you bend that wood, you end up with a super smooth surface that kind of looks like aluminum, or it doesn't sag. I've seen some people use such thin ply, I mean, thin balsa wood over ribs. You can actually see it sag a little bit when they put their covering on or they sand it, because when you sand and push down, the ribs are staying up. So I, I noticed these weird shapes and wings, and I thought, okay, that doesn't matter, does it? It does if it adds weight to an airplane. Every time you take balsa wood and you put fiberglass on it and put resin, that balsa wood becomes a sponge. That's one reason I love to use monocoat and then paint it. It's so much lighter. And when you start thinking about all the parts that you're cutting out, okay, you cut out all these parts normally out of light plywood, then you put some balsa wood stringers in there and then you put the balsa wood skin on it and do, do this test. Take a piece of soft balsa wood, not hard, soft balsa, which is lighter, 
and take some epoxy resin and put about a quarter size dab on there and let it cure overnight. The next day, flip it over and start scratching through with an X-Acto knife and see how far that epoxy went into your wood. Now imagine lathering that entire wing up, I'm sorry, putting your glass cloth on, lathering that entire wing up with resin, scraping it all off or using the paper towel method to get everything you can back out. But then imagine how much of that actually soaked into your balsa wood. And it adds a lot of weight. I mean, and I'm gonna redo all my testing, but I was doing one square foot uh, areas of balsa wood, putting different types of resin that were uh, West System, uh, uh, z -poxy, West System, different epoxies, different ones thinned with alcohol. All of them substantially picked up weight from the the uh, resin wicking into it versus just putting monocoat on it. And I know some people hate monocoat, but if you do monocoat right where the seams are, it almost looks like panel lines. <laughs> but uh, I digress there a little bit. But when you design, when you're when you're going to build an airframe from scratch, I'm sorry, from your own design, not scratch. Well, even if you did it from scratch, let's say you bought a Zeroli planes or going to build one of their planes as an electric. I would basically change the way they have all the wood laid out in it. Get rid of virtually all the, the heavy plywood. If it's electric, it can be really light duty. You can reinforce stuff with carbon fiber toe or a mesh, and you can build really, really light. But when you're thinking about the glue, the material, the materials, the covering, at the end of your project, you could be looking at the difference in two or three pounds of weight on the airplane. You really could be. So before I go too far, I want to talk about my sponsor, RTL Fasteners. Um, we all in the RC world have used blind nuts, washers, wood screws, you know, servo screws, all the different screws. Sometimes it's hard to find the little bitty ones. You know, you don't want to go to like, um, which I've done in the past, and go to like um, somewhere online and buy a hundred of something. Sometimes you only need 15 or 20. And when you go to um, RTL and you look at everything they've got, I, there's not much they don't have. So, and also here's the cool thing. If you go to RTL and you buy more than $50 worth of product and you use a code DA30, you'll get 30% off that order. And blind nuts, wood screws, metric standard, they've got it all, okay? So now we're gonna talk about glues for a minute. And this is something I have tested extensively myself. And like I said, I'm gonna redo all my videos to make them more modern, because some of them were done over 10 years ago, and I've learned a lot. So my go-to glue is Type Bond. I love it. But there's certain parts of the airframe where you may want to use an epoxy. So the denser the wood, the harder Type Bond has um, the ability to soak into it. But epoxy, the way it works is it's kind of a gap filler, but it also um, uh, takes, how do I say this? It normally takes longer um, to cure. Well, and I need to back up from it. I hate five minute, I hate 15 minute epoxy. I start at 30 minute and then I use this T88. This is the only thing I use. Believe it or not, T88 is what the um, home builders use, like e e EAA people, somebody who's going to build, uh, like I'm using it on my ultralight, that's how I found it, but I love it for RC. But tight bond is for any time I have balsa to balsa or balsa to light plywood, okay, I'll use tight bond. But if it's plywood to plywood or plywood to hardwood or balsa to hardwood, which I rarely just have balsa to hardwood, I use T88. Superjet is for when I had ADHD and I could not stand to let anything set and dry. I don't know mechanically if there's a big difference because I did some testing and Superjet was just as strong in a joint as my tight bond. But this was a very crude test. I need to update that test. Epoxy is always stronger. But when I build an airplane, I'm always using tight bond and epoxy. I never just use one, and I rarely use any type of a CA type glue nowadays unless it's a field repair. Um, and then I'll still use like a 30 minute of epoxy because I can wait 30 minutes to fly. Now, the reason I learned so much about epoxy, this is the right wing to my ultralight I'm building right now. Okay, this has nothing to do with RC, but all the wood in this is what I considered denser wood. There are less dense woods, which are balsa wood, 
and then there's dense woods, which are like spruce, plywood, um, birch plywood, not the light plywood. Um, so everything in this wing is done with epoxy. There's no tight bond on this wing. Now I've read where some people use tight bond on ultralights. I don't. So I want to explain what happens here. So these are the ribs I had to make and I built a jig and these took forever. Um, and you basically start off by cutting out all these gussets out of, I think it was uh, eighth inch, I think it was eighth inch, birch plywood. And it took forever to cut these out. And if you look at that quarter with the little nail, that's a brass nail that is designed for aircraft. It won't rust. It's covered in some kind of coating also, so it won't tarnish. But it's designed for building airplanes. That's the way they were built in the old days. So basically what happens is, all of the corners and connections of the ribs are done with a gusset made of that birch ply and you put the epoxy on you put your nails in and it takes about 24 hours to really cure i found out this is the strongest this is like a weld i mean this is insane how strong it is so um you can go to amazon and buy the t88 it's not expensive uh, at least relatively speaking and i absolutely love it but it is not used as a finishing resin. It's not used to put glass cloth on. It is a structural adhesive. I use the West Systems uh, epoxy, and that's all I use for putting fat. I mean, putting uh, fiberglass onto um, a balsa skin. So now we're going to talk about balsa wood for a minute and some of the other materials I've used. If you followed me at all, you know my B36 uh, was a balsa project basically. Everything you see in this picture right here uh, is balsa wood except the bulkheads, which was that quarter inch light ply from aircraft spruce. Okay, and of course I got some phenolic tubings and some carbon fiber tubings in there. But the construction was basically balsa. And it, the entire airframe, when the B-36 was done, minus motors, any system, any landing gear, just the physical wood structure, excluding the jet pods, just the balsa wood structure, weighed like 19 pounds in one ounce 257 inch airplane 186 inches long weighed less than 20 pounds it blew my mind it was awesome um because it gets me really excited when i start to learn how to build structurally sound but very light most model airplanes are way overbuilt okay and and just just to say something about the, the engineering of it I, I don't know the math on how strong a structure should be. Basically, if it looks right, it is right. But then I test it. I load test it. I, you know, I've put 150 pounds on a spar one time to see if I could get it to bow. I do all kinds of testing just to make sure I'm going down the right path. That's the reason many times people will say, are you building two wings? I'm not building two full wings, but I'm building a spar on one wing to test that spar, okay? So this is the MSL2 fuselage, all balsa wood except for minimal light plywood for the bulkheads. The firewall was quarter inch um, light plywood with some carbon fiber reinforcement, and it's been updated now. So it's actually eighth inch uh, light plywood because I found out the quarter inch was way overbuilt uh, when I put the electric motor, uh, I'm sorry, when I put my new motor mount and my 3D printed radial up there at that, I got rid of the quarter inch firewall and put an eighth inch on there. <clears throat> and it's it's rock solid. So um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit, it, it, here's something I want you to also understand. There is a idea out there that building with foam is lighter than balsa wood. And that's not true. And, I, and this is where we're gonna go down this rabbit hole real quick. Open structure balsa is always gonna be lighter in a wing than a foam sheeted wing. And I'll explain to you why here in a minute. But it was a problem I had, it was a learning curve I had because I thought in my mind, way back in the late 80s, early 90s, I used to cut foam wings out for a hobby store I worked part-time for called the Prime Cut. And I could probably cut out 30 or 40 cores in a day, uh, which would be 15 airplanes because there was two cores uh, for a wing and I really learned how to use a hot wire and cut it and then I would use the sorghum and the eighth inch balsa wood and, and cover the um, a wing and then um, I would monocoat it or I would glass and paint it 
And I thought that was the lightest way to do it. And it's not, it's not. When I started building open structure balsa wings and using carbon fiber toe for the spars, that was where the holy grail was for building light. Now, the cool thing about foam is, if you're building just the foam wing and you're gonna cover it, it is eight or 10 times faster than doing a built up wing. But what I'm gonna show you here is when you get into a scale project, how that is not true, okay? And look, I would say 80% of what I've learned in my life is by making mistakes. And you all see great flying airplanes. Very rarely did I used to post all of the disasters I had, um, but now I do, because I don't give a crap. Um, you know, haters are gonna be haters no matter what, but, but we learn by doing, okay? So, I cut out a wing for my C-130 but I knew there were gonna be hard points in it, places where my Fowler flaps were attached, places where the nacelles are attached. So how do you put that in a foam wing? Well, here's the wing originally hot wired out, and then here are some of the parts that are gonna go in it, my Fowler flaps and everything. And if you don't remember this, I actually had trackable Fowler flaps that ran on phenolic uh, tracks and it worked beautifully. Uh, one of the sexiest things I've ever designed. But you then cut up your wing like this because inside of each of those openings is where a rib's gonna go. So you're gonna have a foam wing that you're actually putting plywood ribs into. So now you're saying, okay, am I adding weight? You are adding weight. This, this wing ended up being a complete fat pig lead sled wing, which it didn't bother me because of the size of the plane, the cube loading was gonna be so low, it still flown great because 181 inch wingspan. So here's the wing with the ribs um, glued in, and these were epoxied into the uh, foam, and you can see the center section. And this was when I put in the um, Fowler flaps mechanisms. And then this was the Fowler flaps and the wings, and you can see I got the nacelles on it. So I went from the mentality, I'm building a foam wing, which is gonna be fast, but it wasn't fast, because <laughs> I had to cut out all these freaking parts. So when the C-130 started, I kind of had this like nine month period in my head. Oh, I'm gonna build the whole thing in nine months. And when I started on this wing, it became painfully clear I should have done a built up wing. Because A, the built up wing has all kinds of cubic volume inside of it that you can hide parts and pieces and stuff wires and everything. With a foam wing, you gotta create channels for all your servo wires and any system that's gonna run through it. Then you gotta cut all this junk out. And I remember looking at this and going, holy crap. I, you know, I would have had to cut these out if I were doing a built-up wing. You know, I would have just had to do maybe an extra 20 ribs. And, you know, then I'd had stringers in it. And I would have had a built-up wing. But the cool factor is when this wing was done, the Fowler flaps worked perfect. The ailerons worked perfect. My hard points for the nacelles was perfect. Everything about this wing when it was done was perfect but it took three times longer than i thought it would and it ended up weighing a boatload it was just a freaking lead sled of a wing um i was embarrassed how heavy it came out because i should have done a built-up wing um but i learned from that okay i learned from that and hopefully you're learning from that so on the left hand was day one when i started cutting the foam and on the bottom right hand was um a hell of a lot of stress, but it was a wing that was done, okay? So, I'm gonna talk about another form of building with foam, okay? So I just went down the path of, we talked about the B36 being balsa, we talked about the C-130 wing being foam, we're gonna talk about fiberglass fuselages here in a minute, but I wanna talk another piece of foam right now since I was just talking about foam. This is called the Fryamastein. This is a top secret project that I had shared with the world, but I ran into a major problem in the design and I shelved it because I didn't want to get frustrated. I needed to redesign something. It was going to take me two months to redesign it. So originally this is all going to be pink foam from a hardware store. It's all going to be the quarter inch stuff. I couldn't find the thinner stuff that didn't have waves in it, but I didn't think it mattered. It matters. But so this aircraft, just so you know, has working spoilers in the wing, okay, like a B-52, has little bitty ailerons, has leading edge slats to deploy, has a big barn door opening like a C-130, 
It is a freaking crazy airplane. Now, originally I had the horizontal stabilizer down on the fuselage, but then I went to a T-tail on it um, just because of some design changes. Um, this is one of the spoilers not deployed. This is a spoiler deployed. I designed all of this in 3D. There's four high torque servos in there. I 3D printed all the parts for this and it slid right into the wing perfect. But then I ran into a big problem. That freaking wing weighed so much when I was done, when I'd glassed it and painted it, that I literally just wanted to run it through my table saw, cut it in half and throw it in the dumpster. I'm all about building smart. Okay, I wanted this plane to weigh 65 pounds empty and carry 40 pounds worth of cargo that we could drop out on parachutes, okay? It ended up 76 pounds, which means I could still get it in the LMA1 AMA waiver, but that really bothered me because I wanted to be enough under I could carry like five or 10 pounds and do all my testing and then go to an AMA inspector, load the cargo in there and get it um, okayed for up to 125 pounds, okay? So the plane just, just went out of control because I was learning and I, I don't want to say I was stupid because I'm exploring. I had never used this foam on a 230 inch wing. Okay. So here's the, with the new T tail I made, which was just absolutely a lead pig. I mean, lead sled. It was just stupid heavy. Um, this is all going to be built up. The outboard wings are going to be built up balsa wood and carbon fiber and a little bit of plywood. The entire T-tail, when it's done, is gonna be all balsa wood. I'm gonna literally take eight pounds out of the airplane doing this, or maybe even nine. Um, this was a full span, but one cool thing about this plane is it has a tractor, two tractor motors in the front and two pushers on the back on those nacelles, which are Hacker A60s. Um, this whole plane is gonna have about 9,000 watts, and it's gonna be, a, it's gonna fly so beautiful. Um, it's just gonna be crazy. So, but, Foam is cool, but you need to do some experimenting if you're going to go giant scale. Now, look, this plane would have flown fine at that weight, but it didn't hit my target weight. So I don't want to deter anybody who's building a big, fat, pig, uh, pink foam airplane. If it does end up heavy, just get it inspected and go fly it. I'm building this kind of as a research project for me, okay? Because I have so many systems, the leading edge slats, the spoilers, um, very long flaps, little bitty ailerons. Um, there's actually going to be a motor mounted backwards in the back of the airplane. So when I land, I can go to full throttle and that's my break. So there's going to be five engines on this when it's done and it's going to be insane. And we could drop, I think we figured out 250 Teletubbies from the cargo hold. So, um, we're going to talk about fiberglass fuselage real quick here. And I'm going to try to keep this thing going so it doesn't go forever. But as you know, the C-130 had a fiberglass fuselage. So uh, basically the way I did that was I took my band saw and cut out all the parts for a plug. Okay, this isn't the fuselage, this is a plug. On the left, you can see all the remnants of all the foam I killed. And on the right is one half the fuselage. So I made two halves, glued it together. I puttied the hell out of this thing. Then I put glass cloth on it and I painted, primed, and polished, and waxed that. Then I put glass cloth on that and finished it out and then popped it off so it was like a reverse people call it a reverse mold but it's really pulling the skin off a plug so i ended up with this now most molds look like this part right here but i made what's called we call a reverse mold but it's really a, a, a you're pulling the skin off a plug so then you start cramming all your parts in there <clears throat> a friend of mine made an airplane this way and he had the fiberglass too thin when he would fly and do a real quick roll, and if you were taking pictures of it, you could see the skin wrinkle. If you look at the front of a B-52 and you look at all of that aluminum wrinkling, it's because that, that skin is, is the, the, over the years, the fuselage has sagged and that skin is showing the wrinkles, okay? If you build your fiberglass too thin, the fuselage could, could twist and move around. Now his plane never broke in half, but it was kind of awkward to see the wrinkles in his fiberglass. I went the other way. I put too many layers on. This thing is too heavy, but it was awesome. I should have done two less layers of glass cloth. I don't remember how many I had. I know I'm going to have people saying, how many layers did you have? I think I had six layers of inch, I mean, 1.75 ounce, and I really just needed four, I think. So when the fiberglass fuselage was done, that's pretty much 
what it looked like with the plane. As you all know, I sold that right before it was done and I got a bunch of haters out there, but hey, it's my money, it's my life, it's my projects. You're along for the ride. I love you all, okay? So now what we're gonna do is talk about finishing. And this is where I have learned a ton. When you take a balsa wood wing, you put three quarter ounce cloth on it, you lather on your resin, it soaks right in, then you, me personally, I do the credit card method where I squeegee off every bit of the resin I can, okay? Now this is um, the West system where I, where I thin it by 10% with denatured alcohol. It helps it flow a lot better. And it's epoxy, not polyester resin. I don't use any polyester because polyester, if it wicks into the foam, it will eat the foam up. Polyester should not be used anywhere near foams. Epoxy's okay. But I would squeegee off all of the resin, <clears throat> then I would literally take paper towels and unroll them and pat them down and you would still get more resin out. But just in the 20 minutes it takes that, the resin has soaked into your balsa wood. <clears throat> you're adding weight. Now, if you don't care about the weight and you're not building to create the lightest possible aircraft, it doesn't matter. Because a lot of you are fine flying flying planes, especially if they're over 80 inches and the Q wing loading comes in, that the bigger they get, the better they fly in the air, okay? So the thing is, is that if you're building a little 60 size airplane, weight is everything. I mean, a 60 inch airplane, weight is everything. If it's 150 inches, weight is not that important unless you just do something silly. But my favorite method, believe it or not, is Monaco. I love this stuff. If I, not if, because I'm doing a video on it right now. When I redo the B-36, I will not glass that airplane. It will all be monocoated and painted. And here's the thing. You monocoated an airplane like this, which by the way, is, I think was four 30-foot rolls. <laughs> it was insane. Or it's three 30-foot rolls. Um, look, it's not necessarily cheaper. Well, it is cheaper probably than glass and epoxy and all the time. But the, the monocoat, if you take your time and learn how to do monocoat, I always tell people to learn how to monocoat a shoebox perfectly and then monocoat a bowling ball. If you can learn to do those two things, you can monocoat anything. Shoebox, I'm talking about the lid, get it around the corners, do the bottom, get it around the corners, bring it in, have the right size lid, lip, and then do a bowling ball. If you can monocoat those two things and monocoat the bowling ball so it looks like a globe that you would have like the, the Earth or the Mars on or my planet, Alpha Centauri, where I came from, but, which is a star, I shouldn't have said that, but Monaco I love, but I want to tell you the trick about Monaco. You can paint it, take like 1200 or 1500 grit sandpaper, tape off really nice with the blue tape where you don't want to sand. Lightly sand and buff all the Monaco you're going to paint. Then when you're done, take an air compressor carefully. You don't want to blow it through your monocoat and balsa wood. Stand back about this far. Blow off any of the dust. Then take um, a cotton uh, like t-shirt that you've washed, but don't wash it with any fabric softener. It leaves a residue. Then put some alcohol on it and wipe your monocoat and then paint it. And believe it or not, all the blue on the MSL2 is Krylon from a hardware store, and it's not chipped, flaked, or done anything. Okay, it sticks, and it sticks well. I had a top flight Corsair from the 90s I built. I monocoated it all in chrome monocoat, then painted it blue, and I scratched off the paint to make it look like the aluminum under the paint. It was gorgeous, and unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of that plane that upsets me. And then lastly, I want to talk about something kind of cool. Um, now, when I was a kid, I built Gillow's kits, and I'd always do the stick and tissue and the dope and cover the airplane, and then I would paint it with watercolors or whatever. But there's also another method that a friend of mine over in England did, and it looked really good. If you know what meat packing paper looks like or that brown burlap paper, the heavier stuff, he actually covered a Gillow's kit with that. He is very careful. He used Elmer's glue, kind of like paper mache, overlap the edges, cover the entire airplane with it, and it looked just like a fiberglass kit. And he sanded, you know, the Elmers, and he actually mixed the Elmers in with a little bit of micro balloons, and just the airplane looked incredibly good, and it was light. Then he painted it, and 
I, I just couldn't believe, because the cool thing was is that burlap paper, not burlap paper, it's the brown paper like meat packing paper, um, it's stronger than tissue. The problem with tissue is you poke it with a pencil and you put a hole in it. So that's pretty much it, everybody. I know this one went way too long, and I don't have a script here. It's just like we're sitting in a room just kind of hanging out and talking, um, and I, I don't mean for these to go so long. But look, if you have any questions, if you go to my homepage on YouTube, and I think it's the About, there's an email there. And a lot of people are like, how do I get contact you? You can email me. Or you can put it in the comments below. Tell me what kind of video content you want also. And please like and subscribe and share my videos everywhere, okay? I'm trying to build my YouTube content. And uh, I'm trying to help modelers not be afraid. You know, I don't know how many people I've met at a field and they walk up and go, oh, I'd be scared to build something like that. I said, the only thing that scares you is the money. <laughs> you know, don't, don't, don't worry about failing. Be worried that your wife or significant other or your mom or whoever is going to be pissed at you if you just spend oodles of money and then the thing doesn't work out right. And then you spend oodles of money and you just keep massaging a disaster until you finally fly it. And everybody goes, wow, what did that cost? And you say, well, it should have cost 500 Well, what did it really cost? 1500 How did it cost 1000 extra dollars? Because I have a whole trash can of balsa and plywood at home that just didn't work. Okay? So... I want people to be creative. I want people to engage model aviation. You know, when I was a kid, I grew up, and I'm older than dirt, I grew up being just completely mesmerized by Apollo. And it was deeply emotional watching us go to the moon. Nowadays, most kids are, and I, I, don't, I, know, I, I don't want to categorize, nowadays, there's so many distractions that we've got a whole world of almost ADHD. Everybody's wanting everything instant, instant uh, gratification. Everything's gotta be instant. Nobody wants to take the time. Nobody wants to spend a year on a model airplane, except some crazy dude like me. So I want you, I want you if you're younger and you're starting to get into this and you're thinking about scratch building, start with a little Gillows kit. Put a little electric motor and there's some micro servos or, or just build a flat, Foamy. I mean, there's so many foamies that don't even have airfoils that fly great. Okay. Um, and I'm actually going to do a whole video about choosing airfoils because it's all BS when it comes to model aviation. You can pick either a Clark Y, a semi symmetrical, or a full symmetrical wing. Doesn't matter anything about all the numbers and it's going to fly fine. Okay. <laughs> but I'm going to get into that in another video. So, look, everybody, thank you so much for all the positivity that comes out to me. I know I've got a couple of old time. Um, trolls that follow me that have not built anything big, have not built anything significant, and they want to tell me what to do. Believe it or not, it, it cracks me up. I just, you know, I've, I've done this way too long to let trolls bother me. That's the reason I don't argue with them. I'm just like, hey, have a fantastic day and rock on. And that's what I'm going to say to you all. So have a great day. Um, make sure you like and comment, and I'll see you next time. Okay? Rock on, take care, be safe, and, and just have some fun with this hobby. See you next time. Bye.